A friend of mine was writing a book on art teaching, and that friend is a high school teacher. They had a chapter on classroom management, and because they knew that I had taught middle school for 22 years before switching to high school, they turned to me for advice on uh, middle school classroom management. So this is the advice uh, that I gave. In my 33-year career, I've taught all ages from pre-K to adult, but the vast majority of my experience comes from my 22 years of teaching middle school. I explained to him that teaching middle school was a completely different experience from any other age group. So he emailed me a few questions and I responded. One, how would you say high school and middle school classroom management differ? Now, to clarify, I've been teaching high school for the past four years after having taught middle school for 22. Um, and number two, what strategies can a teacher employ if their class seems particularly wild and the threat of detentions do not work? How might that differ for middle school and high school? So this was my response. First off, I never threaten detentions. I've never seen punishment of any kind work. Second of all, you say a class, but surely there are some kids in there that are not misbehaving. It's rarely the whole class. As a teacher, you want to reach every child, but you want to start with the kids that are most willing to learn and try and cause a domino effect from them. Um, the other kids essentially are going to get jealous for your attention and they're going to start working so that they get it. Whereas if you start with the kids that are the most difficult, the kids that are wanting to do artwork are going to instead want attention and the domino effect will go the other way. Um, there are some preconceptions you need to get rid of before you begin. The first is your vision of all the great projects you wanted to do. Put those materials away or lock them up for now. This is the answer to the question about having a particularly unruly class. You're going to use them later once you help the kids develop some self-control. The goal of discipline is to help students develop self-discipline. If your mindset pits you against your students, you'll have failed before you've even begun. If you've ever taught in an overcrowded middle school, one that lacks strong leadership, there may come a time when a class goes completely out of control. As in, they grab every single thing they can, get their hands on, and start throwing stuff at each other. They steal all your supplies, start dismantling equipment in your room, and deliberately break things. I'm not exaggerating. It happens. And if you don't know how to respond, it can keep happening. Maybe there will be a certain period of the day. Maybe it's a specific class. Maybe there are so many of them that you don't even know their names. What if calling the office doesn't work? What if nobody comes? What if you have a few great classes and a few great kids and you really want to stick this out? Then it's time for a reset. For middle school, start out by coming up with a list of classroom rules. No more than between five and seven. Try to make the rules positives, not negatives. In other words, return to your seat after cleanup instead of no wandering around. Stay away from the door instead of no lining up before the bell. Figure out the deal breakers, the things that drive you crazy. These things are going to be different for every teacher. Um... I was at one point supposed to come up with a bunch of rules that were common throughout several different classrooms, and it was problematic because the music teacher and the drama teacher really wanted no gum chewing because it interferes with your ability to play a musical instrument and your ability to do acting. And I actually don't really care that much about um, gum chewing, and I felt like if I only get to have five rules, I'm not going to waste one on something I don't care about. So we kind of came to loggerheads about it, and I kind of dug my heels in, and in the end, each classroom came up with different rules, and I think that that's best. I think it's really bad when you try and make rules uniform again uh, uh, throughout classrooms. Um, you can have school rules, but each teacher needs to be able to set the tone they need in their own classroom. That level of autonomy needs to be in place, and I would fight it if some administrator tries to tell you that it has to be uniform throughout a department or uniform throughout classrooms. I think that 
students need to be able to code switch. They need to be able to say, okay, in this room, this teacher is going to tolerate this, but in this other room, it really bothers her. Um, so, uh, let's see. Make sure whatever rules you come up with that they are always in effect. And I mean always. So, for instance, if keep hands, feet, and objects to yourself as a rule, you don't shoot baskets of crumpled paper across the room, and you never toss someone an eraser when they need one, you hand it to them, make them come over and get it from you, or you go to them. No tossing it. In other words, <clears throat> be so consistent that it hurts. <clears throat> don't do anything in front of your students that you do not allow your students to do. If you have to have a snack at your desk because you're hypoglycemic or you get nauseated after period three, if you haven't eaten since breakfast, you're going to have to let your students eat in the room. If you ban food from the room and ban drink from the room, then you're going to have to never eat in front of your students. Consistency is the key. You have to be consistent enough that you can look each student in the eye and enforce every single rule without a single shred of hypocrisy. So that means there has to be some flexibility. If there's ever a single exception to a rule, then it's not a real rule, is it? So get rid of it and try something else. And again, it comes down to what you care about. Um, when we're not dealing with COVID-19, I really don't care if students eat in the room as long as they're not eating right over the computers. So because of that, um, my classroom atmosphere is going to look different from somebody else's. Um, when high schoolers misbehave, they're leaving, they're usually doing things like they're leaving class without permission, or they're talking while you're talking, or they're texting under the table, or not just doing their work, just not doing any work at all. They're hanging around talking. But this is all manageable stuff. It's no big deal. Any book can tell you how to handle it. It's teaching 101. However, when middle schoolers misbehave, it can literally turn into Lord of the Flies within a few minutes. So the trick is to never let it get to that point, to address the smaller behaviors those first few weeks of school and to lay down the expectation of what is and isn't acceptable and then to really, really, really consistently always follow through and, you know, the first day you see a three kid throw something is the day that you call their parent after school that day. Um, but then maybe call three other parents and give them positives um, so that the next day that kid's going to come to school all bitter and angry because you called his mom. And there's going to be three other kids who say, yeah, she's such a nice teacher. She called my mom and said all this great stuff about me, which is going to completely diffuse that student's anger, because they're going to want that too. Um, a middle schooler will act like your best friend one minute and your worst nightmare the next, so the key is to not take anything personally. If a child you thought you were close to starts acting disrespectful or rude, don't let your feelings get hurt. Whatever is going, whatever they're going through, it's really about them and where they are in their headspace. It's not a personal thing. Um, sometimes a student will even act out only with a teacher they feel safe around. This is one reason why detentions don't work, by the way. So imagine yourself as a child, you're desperate for love and attention and misbehaving uh, for your favorite teacher. You're then rewarded with extra time with that teacher, a detention. So uh, I actually didn't have a clue about this. The last time I assigned a detention to a student was sometime in the late 1990s. I had this young man in seventh grade and I, I, he would literally do anything and everything to get detention and I just had no clue what was going on. So about a year afterwards, he told me that the reason why he did that was because he was so in love with me and that he wanted to get detention so he could spend time with me after school. Now, that might sound a little creepy, but it actually happens to teachers who are fat, tiny, little, gray-haired, little old ladies. It doesn't mean when a kid says they are in love with you, it doesn't mean what you think it means. 
It just means that they're very hungry for, um, you know, some sort of connection with another person and they feel it with you. So, um, you know, it doesn't have to be creepy or sexual or anything like that. It could just be that that child is very desperate and needy and you happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and you are inadvertently reinforcing an undesirable behavior and that's not doing you any favors, it's not doing the student any favors, um, it's not what your relationship with your student should be all about and, um, it, you know, the last thing you want is to uh, inadvertently reinforce it. Um, but if that student hadn't come right out and told me what the dynamic was, I really wouldn't have a clue. I, I knew it wasn't working, but I didn't know why. Um, so you can consider natural consequences. You can seek restorative justice. You can ask students to take ownership of their behavior. You can call parents. You can even ask for an apology. But begin with the end in mind. What do you want to happen? Is your goal to be able to reach the student? Because if it is, you can clearly see how punishment for the sake of punishment would be counterproductive. It will only breed resentment, and that resentment's going to bleed over into the rest of the class. The other kids aren't going to trust you because they'll see what's happening with this one student. They'll see a power struggle, and they, they'll feel like you don't know what you're doing. Um, um, but what if you want to be able to reach the... Okay, so the answer is you have to be able to reach the best students because that's the way you want the dominoes to fall. So you need to be able to reach the children most willing to learn. So what if you had instructions written on worksheets and that way you didn't have to get the class quiet at the beginning of the period because you just handed them out and it was, the onus was on them to read the instructions. Um, what if you had YouTube videos with demonstrations on them? What if you had a step-by-step -step process that the best students could use to access learning? And what if you were able to take every piece of destructive power out of the hands of the most troubled students? What if the only way for a desperately troubled student to gain access to your attention was by doing the, their work? What would happen then? You'd still have troubled students. Classroom management can't solve every one of society's ills but now you'd be in a better position to help them.